This chapter of the book, in the book of Jude is really a parallel chapter with 2 Peter chapter 2. You probably already know that. But in 2 Peter 2 and in the book of Jude, we have this discussion and teaching identifying and warning us about false prophets. In verse number 3 of the book of Jude, the Bible reads, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. He's saying, I intended, I wanted to write you a letter about the common salvation that we share through our faith in Jesus Christ. But he said, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. He said, I had to change the topic of my letter here. This is Jude in his earthly mind speaking. Uh, obviously, these words are written by the Holy Ghost before the world ever began. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But he's saying here, I have to write to you to tell you that you need to fight for what we believe. Because he said, you must contend or fight or battle for the faith. For, in verse 4, for there are certain men crept in unawares. He's saying, it has just come to my attention that these people have infiltrated your church and many other churches. They've crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord, Jesus Christ. Now you say, what does that mean that they were before or of old ordained to this condemnation? This letter is a condemnation of those people as we read it. He's going to condemn them and explain. He's going to expose their sin. He's going to condemn them to hell uh, in this chapter. And he says, they were before of old ordained to this condemnation because this book was written before the world ever began. He's not saying that certain people were chosen by God to be a false teacher. Wrong. Every man sins when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Every, and, and that's what leads to false teaching. And so that's what he means there. He's saying this condemnation was ordained by God before the world ever began. That's when the book was written, condemning and damning false prophets. Now, I'm going to preach a sermon, and I have seven points, and I really could have had a hundred points. I mean, I was writing down just point after point after point after point, but I picked the seven points that I feel like are the most important points. And the subject is this. How do I identify false prophets? Now, you can think of a hundred different things. But these are seven ways, because I'm not going to get up here and just state the obvious. If somebody's teaching that you work your way to heaven, they're a false teacher. Yeah, everybody knows that. You're a Baptist. But these are the ways to identify those who will try to creep in. That's the subject this morning. And that we're going to spend time going back and forth between a lot of passages. And it's amazing how God lists these several things in each passage. 2 Peter 2, the book of Jude. 1 John chapter 2 is another great source when you're looking at false prophets. <laughs> Titus chapter 1, and, and we're going to go back and forth between a lot of those. But number one, point number one, how to identify the false prophets? Number one, they attempt to separate themselves. Look if you would at Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Acts chapter 20. Now in the book of Jude, verse 19, he said, These be they who separate themselves sensual, having not the spirit. You say, what does it mean to separate yourself? Well, look at Acts 20, 28, and, and we'll see Paul mention the same idea. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he had purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock, also of your own selves, He's saying, from among you, people that are crept in unawares. He says, of your own self shall men arise, speaking perverse things. Remember that statement. To draw away disciples after them. Notice that term. To draw away disciples after them. Separating themselves. Drawing people away from the crowd, from the group here in the local church. Look at 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter number 2. Right before the book of Jude at the end of the Bible. 1 John chapter 2. Just a few pages to the left from, from the book of Jude. 1 John 2, 18. Watch this carefully. Little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists. So he's saying one day the big Antichrist is going to come, but right now there are many Antichrists. Whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us. Who went out from us? These Antichrists. These false teachers. 
But they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. So the number one way to identify false prophets is that they seek to separate and divide the church. They seek to separate people and take them off by themselves to draw away disciples after them, to get their own group, their own following, their own separate thing going on. That's what it says in 1 John 2. That's what it says in Acts 20. That's what it says in the book of Jude. Hey, that's the false prophet's modus operandi. He wants to divide you. Now, we ought to have unity in the local church. Now you say, oh, we ought to have unity in Christianity. Eh, wrong. I'm not going to be unified with some liberal Baptist church. I'm not going to, oh, well, he's saved. I don't care if he's saved. The Bible says that if any man walk not after this rule in, in, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, he says, if he follow not the tradition which he received of us, talking about the apostles, it says, note that man and have no company with him. If any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed, yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. So there is a brother, a saved Christian, who's not following the Bible, not preaching right. We're not to have any fellowship with him. So I'm not saying we ought to have unity within every believer or every Christian. But in the church, we ought to all be with one accord, in one place, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, endeavoring to keep the unity and the spirit of the bond of peace. Hey, we have unity in the church. Amen. Unity. Why did the church in the book of Acts have such great uh, results and power with God because they had unity, because they were all in one accord. But notice the next phrase. They weren't just in one accord, they were all in one place. See where we are right now? We're all in one place. This is what the church is, the congregation, right. the assembly. You say, oh, when churches are big, they got to be divided. No, they don't, because in the Bible, you had a church in the book of Acts with... 3,000 people added to 120 people, and then they added daily, and then they multiplied, and yet they were all in one place. Isn't it amazing? They assembled thousands of people together to hear preaching in one place. But you see, the modern movement, and it's a movement that's headed by false teachers, is to divide up the church into all these little groups, to break it down, and, and so that people can take disciples and teach a false doctrine is what's really going on. You see... When we're all in one place, whether I'm as the pastor up here preaching, or whether a guest preacher comes up here and preaches, or whether somebody from the congregation comes up here and preaches, there's no secret about what's being said. Nobody can get up and secretly be teaching false doctrine in this church because we're all here in one place. Everybody knows what's going on. Everybody is here to know whether what's being preached is biblical or not. But when you're divided up, and, and by the way, this is why we don't have Sunday school classes for kids. I'm not going to send my kid into some room with, with somebody that I barely even know Amen. to be preached Amen. to by somebody that I don't know. Say, oh man, I can't believe you say that. That's like 99% of independent Baptists. I don't care. I'm telling you, and, and I'm not saying that the independent Baptists who have Sunday school are false teachers. But I'm saying that when somebody creeps into a church, they love nothing more than to get off by themselves with somebody. Right. So this is not a condemnation of independent Baptists. This is a warning to independent Baptists that when some guy walks through your front door and all of a sudden he wants to start teaching Sunday school, you know, right out of the gate, that guy could be a false prophet. He could be a false right. teacher. And he'd love nothing more than to get your little Johnny and Susie off into a room somewhere where you're not around and preach to them who knows what. That's what I'm saying. So I'm not condemning the church that has Sunday school. I don't think they should have it for this very reason. But the point is, they're just asking to have some infiltrator, some false prophet, some pervert come in because they love to separate themselves. They love to get people away from the group. That's why, see that door right there has been removed from its hinges. See this door right here has been removed from okay. its hinges. There's nowhere to hide in this church. You walk in here, you're with the group. Everybody's around. We don't need people separating themselves, going off and doing their own thing. Hey, we get together and we're in unity. We have an assembly. We're all in one place all the time. That's Faithful Word Baptist Church. This is part of why. Because the people that are false teachers would love to separate the new believer. They beguile unstable souls. 2 Peter chapter 2. You know what that means? Children. You know what else that means? A new convert. No matter what age. They are a babe in Christ. The false teacher wants to get them aside and pervert them and teach them false doctrine. 
because they're unstable in what they believe. When did you get that cool chair? <laughs> <laughs> Good for yourself. <laughs> Are you separating yourself? <laughs> but the point is, uh, and, and listen, let me use an illustration. On Wednesday night, we had a guy come in here. And this guy, and some of you were here listen, and listened to me rebuke this guy. But we had a guy come in here. And he sat down, listened to the service and everything. The first thing he talks about after the service, I mean, just right out of the gate, the first thing he starts telling me is how, oh, hey, I got an idea. And he's like, oh, I've listened to your sermons and everything, you know, trying to get me off guard. Like, he's been listening to the sermons and, like, he's really just on board with Faithful Word. He's been listening to sermons on the internet. He said, I got an idea. He said, you know, you've got to have these small group Bible study because he said, instead of people just listening to you preach all the time, you know, you could be wrong, you know. Well, we got to we got to break it up, he said. And get these small group Bible studies where everybody has a chance to, to share what they know and what they believe. And we can, we can divide up and, and, you know, have like a men's Bible group and, 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 and study the Bible together. And, you know, where other people get a chance. And again, I, I told him, I said this. I said, we believe in the local church. We believe in the general assembly, the congregation. I said, we don't have time to break up into all these little groups. I said, we have three groups, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. I said, these are our groups, and they include everybody. That's our small group Bible study. And, uh, and, and he was just going, and, I, and he would not take no for an answer. I mean, those that were with me when I was talking, he would not take no for, I kept explaining to him why we don't do that, why we do things the way we do, why God ordained the local church. And finally, I just said, well, show me it in the Bible. I said, show me the small group Bible study in the Bible. And he said, iron sharpened a iron. I said, the Bible says Iron Sharp and I showed the man the countenance of his friend. I said, it's talking about friendship. It's not talking about a Bible study group. And so, again, this guy, and, and I'm going to get into him a little bit later in the service, too. Remember this story, because we're coming back to, to this guy. Because he had, like, he had, like, all seven points. Seriously. We, we'll see. Well, not all seven, but, you know, he had, he had enough to, to, for me to peg him as a false prophet pretty fast. But that was the first red flag. The first red flag was just right out of the gate trying to get certain people to come to a Bible study group with just him somewhere else so that he could draw away disciples after him. He's a false teacher. Now, we're in 1 John chapter 2, right? The next part that I'm going to read here is going to lead into my second point. So number one, the false prophet loves to separate himself with others. Number two... And I'm going to read this for you, uh, beginning in verse number 20. But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, and that no lies of the truth. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. Number two, the false prophet. How do we identify him? How can we spot them right away? Number two, they begin to attack the doctrines of the deity of Christ. I'm talking about the fact that Jesus is God, the Trinity, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Anytime you have false prophets, a lot of the time, they will try to somehow, maybe it'll be crafty and sneaky, somehow attack that doctrine of the deity of Jesus Christ, and the doctrine of the Trinity. You say, the word Trinity is not in the Bible. No, it's not, but this verse is in the Bible. For there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. The word Trinity means three are one. That's what it means. So it's the same word. And so they will try to somehow attack or confuse the deity of Jesus Christ. Now, anytime you have somebody saying that the Trinity is unscriptural, they're probably a false teacher. That's a great way to identify it. If they start saying, well, the Trinity is a Catholic doctrine, the Trinity is not right. That's a red flag right there. The Trinity is not a Catholic doctrine, the Trinity is a Bible doctrine. It doesn't matter whether the Catholics believe it or not, maybe that's the one right thing that they believe, but I'm telling you something, the Trinity is a biblical doctrine. There are so many verses that mention the Trinity. You say, oh, it's just 1 John 5, 7. Matthew 28, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You'll find a lot of people that are in the, in the African American community that will say, oh, you have to be baptized in the name of Jesus only. That right there is a sign you're dealing with a false teacher. 
Because they're saying not to be baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost, which is what Jesus commanded us to do in Matthew 28. Baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. They, these tongue-talking charismatics in the black community say that, oh, it's just only in Jesus' name. They're trying to separate Jesus Christ from that trinity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. That's a red flag. Watch out for it. There are other verses that mention the trinity. Here's a great, here's a great verse on the trinity. Uh, you don't have to turn there. 2 Thessalonians, or I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. There you got the three part, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost mentioned in one verse. There are verses all throughout the Bible that will mention all three in one verse. Uh, 1 John chapter 3 has another one. But the point is that when people begin to attack this doctrine of the deity of Christ or this doctrine of the Trinity, that's a red flag. The same guy that was one in the small group Bible study, he made this statement to me while he was here. He said, Jesus never claimed while he was on this earth in any of the four Gospels to be the Son of God. He made this statement to me. He said, Jesus never said he was the Son of God. He said in the book of Isaiah, it said he would be called the Son of God, you know, and, and other people said he would be called the Son of God, but never came it out of Jesus' own lips that he was the Son of God. That's what this guy tried to claim. And I said, sure, did. Let me show you two places. And he looked sharp. Huh? I said, of course it does. I said, I can show you two verses in the book of John. Turn with me and I'll show you. Look at John chapter 9. I said, sure, it does. In two different places in the book of John, it says, Jesus Christ, where he physically with his mouth claimed to be the Son of God. I'm going to show you. Because he was trying to attack the doctrine of the Trinity. He was trying to change things around and, and twist, twist around what the Bible says. And I'll tell you, you say, well, wait a minute, Pastor. I said, why was he so confident that you would not be able to show him? I'll get to that in a moment. Because he's using a different Bible. See, in the King James Bible, he says he's the Son of God. Other Bibles change that. Let me show you what I'm talking about. John chapter 9, verse 35. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when he found him, he said unto him, he says to this man, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. So there, right, there you have it. Jesus saying, I am the Son of God, right there. Let, let me read for you out of the non-inspired version, also known as the NIV. Listen to this out of the NIV. The same scripture in John 9, 35. And this is why this guy thought that uh, the Bible didn't say that, this false teacher, this false prophet. John 9, 35. You look down at the King James, I'll read for you from the NIV. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Big difference. You say, oh, the difference isn't that big. That's a huge difference. Because you know what? Ezekiel is called six times the Son of Man in the book of Ezekiel. He says, Son of Man. That's what God calls him six times in the book of Ezekiel. He says, Son of Man, make thee a roll. Son of Man, do this. Son of Man, do that. Uh, but the Son of God is a little bit different, wouldn't you say? <laughs> oh, let's see. Is there a difference between man and God? Oh, I love the NIV because it's easier to understand. It takes out the these and the thous. It takes out a little more than that. It attacks the deity of Christ. It says that Joseph is Jesus' father in Luke 2.33. And here's another attack. But look at John 10.36. Here's the second place that I showed him. I said, I'll show you two places right now. Flip it open. John 9.35 showed it to him. Flip the page. And said, John 10, verse number 36. Say ye of him whom the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said I am the Son of God. Amen. Amen. Now here was the amazing thing. I showed him that scripture, and what would be the normal thing that he should have said when I showed him these two scriptures? Oh, my mistake. Oh, I was wrong. Oh, my bad. But what did he actually say? Well, let me show you another scripture. Now, here's the third way to identify the false prophet. Are you listening? Here's how you identify him. He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because you're not of God. A person who will not hear God's word, and we, when we say hear, not just with their ears, but actually hearken to it and hear it and understand it. If you can show somebody, point blank in the Bible, where Jesus says, I said I am the Son of God. And they say, oh, well, let's go over here to this other scripture. 
I mean, we're, you're dealing with somebody who's, who's a false prophet. If they're coming in and trying to teach, and that's what they're claiming as their doctrine, that Jesus never said he was the Son of God. Jesus is not the Son of God, is what he said. So number three, what are they, what's the other sign? They won't hear God's word. You could show them something point blank in the scripture. They're a teacher of the Bible. They claim to know the Bible. They claim to be a student of the Bible. And they're trying to separate themselves. Uh, they're, they're attacking doctrines of the Trinity and of the deity of Christ. And then thirdly, you can show them point blank in the Bible and they just walk away still believing their false doctrine. Refusing to admit what's as plain as the nose on your face in John 10, 36. I say I am the Son of God. But yet he didn't believe that. There's a big problem with that, isn't there? So that's, that's number three. Number four, they appeal to a false Bible version or twist what the Bible actually says by going to a foreign language. Here's another, here's another sign of a false teacher. They, they, they appeal to a false Bible version. That's what this guy did because he was saying that Jesus was not the Son of God because he was using a wrong Bible. Or they'll twist what the Bible actually says by saying, well, if you go back into the Greek, it says something completely different. If you go back into the Hebrew, it says something completely different. Wait a minute. That's a false teacher. That's a false prophet. Let me show you why. Look at 1 John chapter 2. This is one of our passages we're going to be going to a lot. We're going to uh, Jude, 2 Peter 2, 1 John 2. These are our three big false teaching passages. Those are the three babies. There are a lot of others, but these are the three that I'm focusing on. 1 John chapter 2, look what it says in verse number... And, and, and keep in mind, this is in the context of him warning about antichrists, false teachers, false prophets in chapter 2. He says in verse number 20, because he just finished talking about these false teachers and antichrists in verse 19. What's the next thing that he says? But ye, verse 20, but ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. Look at that statement. Ye know all things. I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Anybody who tells you that with the Holy Spirit living inside of you, that unction from the Holy One, and the Bible in your lap, if they tell you you don't know all things from your whole, the Holy Spirit and the Bible in your lap, you're dealing with a false teacher because they're teaching something extra biblical. If you have the Holy Scriptures and the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, ye need not that any man teach you. But as the same, go down the page, a few verses to the very end of the chapter. But ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things. And is truth and is no lie. And even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. So right there, God is saying, you don't need man to interpret the Bible for you. You don't need man to translate and go into some foreign language to get you to understand the Bible. Now, if you have a wrong translation of the Bible, get the right translation. But if you got the right translation, and God's more than capable of speaking his word in more than one language. You think God is constrained to speak one language only? Do you think God is unilingual? That he only speaks one language or bilingual? God speaks every language in this whole world. The Bible says that this word of God will be published in all languages. Look at Daniel chapter number uh, 4, I believe it is. Look, at, uh, Don't turn there, I'm just saying look at it some other time. So, I mean, Daniel chapter 4, he said all tongues, all languages. Revelation, all tongues, all languages. Hey, when the, when the Hispanic gets to heaven, it's going to be, well done, uh, Amigo, muchas gracias, you know. He's not going to sit there and expect them to take ESL courses when they get to heaven. God speaks any language. God's word has been in Greek, it's been in Hebrew, it's been in Aramaic, and it can be translated into English, Spanish, whatever language you want. Now, is it always properly translated? No, but it can be translated into any language in this world. Amen. And it has been translated into multitudes of languages. And yet, the modern day uh, Bible theologian wants to limit God and say the only way, the only way to understand the Bible is in the language of Greek. What? Show me, show me all the great Baptist churches in Greece today. They're not there. But I can show you all kinds of great Baptist churches all over the United States of America and elsewhere in the world, in the Philippines and in Korea, but not in Greece. 
And guess what? God can speak any language He wants to speak. His word can be translated. How do you think He translated it from Hebrew in the Old Testament into Greek in the New Testament? Obviously, God's able to translate. Who's the one that divided the languages of the Tower of Babel? God. And if God divided the languages, was He giving preference and saying, only this one language will hear my word. Other people will get a bad copy of a copy. And you're going to lose something. If you lose something in the translation, then why did God divide the languages? And cause some people to not even be able to understand his word without the help of some priest, some Catholic priest. Many a Baptist church has a Catholic priest behind the pulpit saying, Let me interpret the word of God for you. You can't understand it without the help of me. That is false teaching to say that you need something other than the Holy Ghost and the Bible to understand the Bible. That's what it says. And so that's four. I've got to hurry because I've got a lot of points. But number five. And some people aren't going to like this one, but this is, this is as true as the day is long. Number, number five, false prophets. Let, let's do a quick recap. Number one, they attempt to separate themselves from the group in a church, I'm saying. Number two, they attack or confuse doctrines about the Trinity and the deity of Christ. Number three, they appeal to a false Bible version or twist what the Bible actually says through some extra biblical source like a lexicon going back to another language or twisting things. By the way, let, let, let's test this out. The Mormons, they fall in this category right here. They attack the deity of Christ. They don't believe in the Trinity. They appeal to extra-biblical revelation, false books, false doctrine. The Jehovah's Witnesses, same thing. Chain, twist the Bible, you know, translate it to make it say what they want it to say. But number five, they worship the Jews. They worship the Jews. How do you, how do you spot a false prophet, a false teacher? Jew worship. You say, oh man, what are you talking about? Well, we're gonna, I'm going to show you in the Bible. Look at Titus. Well, well, before you... Yeah, look at Titus chapter 1. And we'll read this. Titus chapter 1. There's so much here, I'm trying to get it all in order that makes sense. Uh, Titus chapter 1, and we're going to look at verse 9. And by the way, verse 9 is where the name for our church comes from, Faithful Word Baptist Church. Titus chapter 1, verse 9, the Bible reads, Holding fast the faithful word, as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. So he's saying, there are a lot of false teachers, false prophets. What's the last word of verse 16? Somebody call it out. What's the last word of Titus 1.16? Call it out to me. Reprobate. Did you hear that? Okay. And again, and we're going to get to that in a little bit. But he says in, in uh, verse 10, there are a lot of unruly, vain talkers and deceivers, especially, he's saying, especially they of the circumcision. He's talking about Jews. Are you listening? Look at the name. I didn't write it. Oh, you're anti-Semitic. I'm reading the Bible. I just read a verse. That's not anti. Is it anti-Semitism to read the Bible now? That's what the Bible says. He said the most false teaching was coming out of the Jews. That's what he said. I didn't write that. Look at the next verse. Whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. Who do they subvert? Houses. They go to people's houses. Are you listening? This is like we're talking about the home group where they try to pull you apart and, and get you in some group somewhere. They're not going from house to house preaching the gospel. They're getting into somebody's house and, and teaching them false doctrine uh, on a continual basis, like the Jehovah's Witnesses. See how these are all just, your things are just popping in my mind, just examples of this. The Jehovah's Witnesses, what do they do? Hi, we'd like to come and study the Bible with you. And they come and study the Bible at your house. Do they invite people to church? They don't go door to door. They've never come to my door and invited me to their church. They said, we'll come and study the Bible with you in your house. We'll have a home Bible study. And today, independent fundamental Baptists think that they're so clever and so smart because they come up with this new thing of going out and having home Bible studies with people for three or four weeks in a row and then getting them in church. You didn't make that up. You got it from the Jehovah's Witnesses. You got it from the Watchtower. You didn't come up with anything new. The Bible said go house to house and preach the gospel and then they assembled them together to Jesus. The apostles didn't hold their own little service. The apostles went out two by two, preached the gospel in every house, every village, and then there was assembled to Jesus a great multitude, which no man could number in Luke 11. Then there was assembled to Jesus the 5,000 when he fed the 5,000. 
They went out soul winning and people came to him. They didn't say, oh, we're going to keep coming back to your house every week for a home Bible study like the Jehovah's False Witnesses. But he says, uh, what, what chapter are we in? Titus 1? He says, uh, especially they have the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they are not, for filthy lucre's sake, so they're motivated by money. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, he's saying of these, of these Jewish false teachers, one of their prophets, here's what he said, the Christians are always liars. Now, what kind of a statement is that? Because Titus is in Crete, if you know the context of the book of Titus. Titus is pastoring in Crete. Paul's writing and saying, watch out for these false teaching Jews. One of these guys, one of these well-known false teaching Jews, got up and said, the Christians, talking about Greek people basically, Crete is part of Greece. He's saying the Christians are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. It'd be like if I got up and said, you know what? All Mexicans are this, or all blacks are this, or all the, you know what I mean? He's saying, you know, white, if I said like white is supreme, being white. Now you'd say, Pastor Anderson, that'd be horrible to get up and say that white is supreme. And it would be horrible, be false, be wicked. But that's what the Jews are teaching back then. They believe that the Jews are better than the Gentiles. That's what they believe. Read the Bible. We'll look at the book of Galatians chapter 2, where they wouldn't even eat with the Gentiles. Because of what their stinking rabbi taught them that was not even believing in Jesus Christ, right? Their false teaching phony rabbi taught them, oh, you're not supposed to eat with the Gentiles. God never said that in the Bible. But they added that in the Talmud, in their false rabbinical Judaism religion. And Paul got up and ripped Peter's face and said, who do you think you are eating with the Gentiles until your buddies from Jerusalem come? Then all of a sudden you don't want to eat with the Gentiles. Hey, God has made all men of the earth, all nations of the earth of one blood. Amen. He said the house of God is a house of prayer for all people, all nations. Hey, he said, you need to accept all races as equally. But yet, these Jews thought that they were better than everybody else. And they weren't. And then we'll get into that a little more. But look down. He said, this witness is true. He said, I'm telling you the truth. That's what this guy said. He was saying that the Christians are always liars, evil beasts, so that He says, wherefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables. Right? Jewish fables. Jewish make-believe. And commandments of men. See, not Bible teaching, but commandments of men. Commandments of the rabbis and, and these, these blasphemers who call themselves rabbis. When Jesus said, be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ. That term rabbi is blasphemous according to the Bible. He says, unto the pure all things, and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Verse 15, unto the pure all things are pure. Talking about all people are pure. What God has cleansed, that call not thou common or unclean. God told Peter in regard to people of other nationalities. Because Peter had been brainwashed as a child by the phony rabbi. He says, But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny it, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. Now turn, if you would, to John chapter 1. So we're on point. And I'm not done with point five yet. They worship the Jews. Let me give you an example of a false prophet that you've probably heard of on TV. He's a famous guy who worships the Jews, who's a false teacher. John Hagee. Put up your hand if you know who John Hagee is. You ever heard that name? John Hagee is a false prophet and an antichrist. Look, I would prove you from the Bible right now that John Hagee is an antichrist. Right now. You have a shadow of a doubt. John Hagee, in his book known as In Defense of Israel, Here's your first red flag, worshiping Israel. In his book, In Defense of Israel, John Hagee says, the Jews did not reject Jesus as their Messiah because Jesus did not come to be the Messiah. How could they reject him as the Messiah when he didn't even come to be the Messiah? He didn't come to be the Messiah. He said he just came to be the sacrifice, and so they did what they do with every sacrifice. They killed him. I mean, have you ever heard of something so insane as that the people who killed Jesus were doing the right thing because they were killing the Lamb? Unbelievable, the false doctrine. But he said, Jesus did not come to be the Messiah. Now, let's see if that's true. And he said this, 
Kind of like the guy on Wednesday night said, Jesus never claimed to be the Son of God. John Hagee got up and said, and I've, got, I've got a video clip of him saying it. I've got the excerpt from the book where he says the picture of the page. John Hagee, because now he's gone back and edited the book a little bit because people flipped out when he put this book out. And so he has a new edited version where he goes back and, oh, well, you know, that's not really quite what I meant. Of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaking. You phone it, false prophet, liar. But I got the video clip and the, and the picture of the book where he says it. He says, Jesus never claimed to be the Messiah while he was on this earth. Let's see if that's true. Look at John chapter 1. And John 4 is where he's going to claim to be the Messiah. But look at John 141. This is talking about Andrew. Andrew, he findeth first his own brother Simon and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. Now, who's interpreting it for us? Andrew? No. The author of the book of John is interpreting it for us. John can walk up to people and say, We found the Messiah. Let me interpret that for you. In Greek, that's Christ. Because the person he's talking to knew what Messiah meant. But the, book of, the author of the book of John here is interpreting it for us, the reader, so that we will know what is the interpretation of Messiah? Christ. So basically what John Hagee is saying is, Jesus never claimed to be Christ. Jesus didn't come to be the Christ. Does that sound like good doctrine? Unbelievable. And yet, he's on TV this week. He's all over TV. He has thousands and hundreds of thousands of followers all over this country tuning into his radio program, tuning into his TV program. And yet he says that Jesus is not the Christ. Look at verse uh, 25, chapter 4. Turn over to chapter 4. John 4, 25, the Bible reads, The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah is cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. So did Jesus claim to be the Messiah? Yes. Did he say he was the Christ? Yes. Did he say he was the Son of God? Yes. And yet people will follow the false teacher who lies about these things. John Hagee worships the Jews. He believes that Jews who do not believe on Jesus Christ as their Savior will still go to heaven if they're a devout Jew even if they don't believe on Jesus Christ. Heresy. False doctrine. But see, you should have known he was a false prophet even before he came out and said those things when you saw him worshiping the Jews. Because the Jews are not God's chosen people, my friend. The election is different than Israel. Because Israel, the Bible says, not all that are of Israel, he said, not everybody who's called Israel is of Israel. He said, it's the children of the promise, not the children of the flesh. He said, if he be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Romans chapter 2. He is not a Jew which is one outwardly, nor is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart and spirit, whose praise is not of men, but of God. Philippians chapter 3. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. The Bible says, For they also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have the Jews. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, who both killed the Lord Jesus, so who killed Jesus? The Jews. Who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us, and they please not God, and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sins always, for the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. God's wrath is resting upon the Jews. You say, why is God's wrath? You say, oh, God's blessing the Jews. God's blessing the nation of Israel. I'll curse them to curse me. I'll bless them to bless me. That wasn't spoken to the Jews. It was spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He saith not seeds as of many, but seed as of one. His seed is Christ. And if you be Christ, are you Abraham's seed? And heirs according to the promises that the blessings of Abraham might come on the Gentiles. This is what the Bible says. And I don't care what anybody else says. They can go worship a race of people. Worship a physical race. And say, oh, Jerry Seinfeld. Who cares if you're a pervert? Who cares if you don't believe on Jesus Christ? You are God's chosen people, Jerry Seinfeld. Because you were born into that family. That is such false doctrine. That is such garbage. Good night. I had some great scripture on that. And I, can't, I forgot what it was. You just give me a minute. <laughs> trying to think what it was. There's some some verse just popped in my mind. Ah, oh, man, it's killing me. Look, if you 
if you think the Jews are God's chosen people, just you can download the sermon on Romans chapter two, download the sermon on racism back in December a couple years ago. I mean, good night. Could anything be more clearly preached in the Bible than the fact? Oh no, hey, I just thought. Thank God. John chapter three. Are you in chapter four? Perfect. Hey, look at John three thirty six. The Bible says, you, you say, why is God's wrath resting on the Jews like it says it is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2? God's wrath is resting on the Jews because he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Amen. If Jerry Seinfeld doesn't believe on the Son, it doesn't matter when he was born. The wrath of God is abiding on him right now. Just like every unbeliever. And, and look, are there Jews that are saved? Yes, there are. And they are blessed with faithful Abraham. They're God's chosen people just like I'm God's chosen people. But the unbelieving Jew is not God's chosen people. He has God's wrath resting on him just like every other unbeliever in this world. Face it. It's the truth. And if you don't believe it, you're probably just been sucked in by some false teacher. Because you didn't get it from the Bible, your false teaching. Because the New Tech, have you ever tried to read Romans, Galatians, and 1 John? You'll find out who is a liar, but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. The Jews believe that Jesus is not the Messiah. The Jews believe Jesus is not the Christ. They think the Christ is still coming, that the Messiah is still coming. They're going to worship the Antichrist and think that he's Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible says. And so when somebody is worshipful toward the Jews, that's a sign of a false teacher, a false prophet. John Hagee being a perfect example. So number five, they worship the Jews. Number six, and i got to hurry, I'm running out of time. Turn back to the book of Jude, the end of your Bible. But see, you've got to watch out because this stuff creeps in. Peter said in St. Peter chapter 2, there will be false prophets among you. He said it will happen. Paul said, I know that after my departing, grievous wolves will enter in. Jude said, there are men crept in unawares. This isn't something that might happen. It will happen. We've got to know what to look for. If somebody starts attacking the Trinity and the deity of Christ, you run. Somebody starts to, wants to they just die to get people apart from the group and, and separate out the group, you run. These are the bad signs. Somebody just worshipping the Jews and wants you to send money to, to put Jews back in Israel and, and all this stuff. You know what Israel... Oh, in 1948, God made the nation of Israel to fulfill His promise to the Jews. Baloney. That nation of Israel was established in 1948 so that one day the Antichrist can rule from Israel. And you know what the Antichrist is going to do? He's going to rebuild the temple. And you know what he's going to do? He's going to sacrifice a lamb every morning and every night in the temple. And let me tell you something. Jesus Christ is the sacrifice once slain for all. That's right. Amen. We don't need another lamb being offered on an altar. And that's what those Jews are going to do over there when the Antichrist becomes their leader. And any Jew who's here in this sermon, or, or anybody who, who you run into that's a Jew, hey, they need to get saved just like everybody else, right. and then they'll be God's people. I, you say, oh, you're anti-Semitic. You hate the Jews. I don't hate the Jews. I hate their false religion. Amen. Just like I hate Catholicism. Just like I hate Islam. I don't hate a race of people. I is. It, let me ask you this. Is it anti-Semitic for me to say that all races are equal? You see what I'm saying? Yet I'm called the racist for saying that Jews and whites and blacks and Asians are all equal. That doesn't make me a racist. The Jews are the racists. And the false Bible teachers that worship the Jews, they're the racists because they're telling you that a Jew is better than you because of the color of his skin or because of his, his uh, nationality or ethnicity. When God does not respect our persons, God treats all you know, ethnicities equal. So who's the racist? The guy who's getting up saying everybody's equal in God's eyes or the person who's telling you, well, they're God's chosen people because they're the Jews. Don't curse Jeff Goldblum. Because he's one of the Jews. Don't curse Steven Spielberg. He's one of the Jews. Don't curse Richard Dreyfuss. He's one of the Jews. Don't curse Jerry Seinfeld. He's one of the Jews. You know what? Damn them all. Damn every, uh, damn every single Hollywood whore and whoremonger, whether they're a Jew or a Gentile. Right? That's the way I feel about it. I mean, that's... Oh, but you can't say that because of the Jews. Oh. I, used to, I preached against Jerry Seinfeld for years, and then I found out he was Jewish. Now I have to apologize. 
Because he's God's people. He's a pervert. And anybody who's ever watched that show knows that he's a pervert. I watched it as a teenager before I was right with God. It's a wicked, perverted show, and if you watch it, you need to get right with God. It's probably been off the air for years. I don't know, are they syndicating it or something? Who knows? But uh, we got to hurry. Jude, Jude verse 3, number 6. Why are you preaching this sermon? You've got to be able to spot these people. Otherwise, you'll be deceived by them. Number 6. They're perverted. Yes, the false prophet is perverted. Let me prove it to you. Look at, look at uh, Jude. He says in verse 4, For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise, he's saying in the same way, these filthy dreamers defile the flesh. So the, these false prophets defile the flesh in the same way of Sodom and Gomorrah. What was the way of Sodom and Gomorrah? Homosexuality. What was the way of Sodom and Gomorrah? Rape. What was the way of Sodom and Gomorrah? Molestation. Those three ways right there are what you think of when you read Sodom and Gomorrah. He says the false prophet, the false teacher, defiles the flesh the same way. Look at 2 Peter chapter 2, the parallel passage, back a few pages. 2 Peter chapter 2. Do you think it's a coincidence that all these Catholic priests are, are pedophiles? That's not a coincidence. It's funny because I've been preaching that since I was a teenager. Before the big, remember, because it came out like a big scandal after I was a teenager. When I was a teenager, people would tell me, all oh, these Catholic priests, they're just wrong, they're just mixed up, they just need Jesus, they're just confused. I said, no, they're wicked. They're evil. I said, the Pope's evil. The Pope's filled with Satan. I said, the Pope's an antichrist. And all these priests, they're teaching wicked false doctrine. And I said, they're perverted. They're wicked. They're evil. They're satanic. And then sure enough, it comes out a few years later how they've all been molesting and, and doing all this perverted stuff. Because let me just remember this one thing. If you want to remember one thing from the whole sermon. The false prophet and the pervert are one and the same. Second Peter 2 and Jude. That's a, just get that one statement. Second Peter 2 and Jude. And listen. Your homework assignment after this sermon, because I don't even have time to go through 2 Peter 2 and Jude. I'm trying to show you 1 John, Acts, you know, all these different places, Titus. If you want to, if you want to do some further study on false prophets, you need to just read 2 Peter 2 and Jude over and over again. I mean, it will come out. You'll see exactly the patterns that I'm talking about. And more, more that I don't have time to go into. Hundreds of points. And so he says in 2 Peter 2, 1, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. Even among faithful Word Baptist Church. Now, we, we spot them so fast, they don't even hardly make it through one service. Thank God. <laughs> this guy showed up on Wednesday night, and you know what I told I rebuked him sharply, like the Bible says. Amen. Oh, man, I can't believe you were so rude to him. I rebuked him sharply, because that's what the Bible... Did you not read that with us in Titus chapter 1? Now, look, if somebody's unsaved, I'm kind to of them. Somebody's just an unbeliever, and they're not saved. I'm going to give them the gospel. If they reject the gospel, I'm still kind to them, still loving. But when somebody comes in here, a wolf in sheep's clothing, <laughs> pretending to be one of us, trying to draw people aside to teach them blasphemy about the name of Jesus Christ, I sat there and showed them from the Bible. I gave them three times. Three times I proved them wrong from the Bible, from the scriptures, point blank, and three times he rejected it. And he was trying to just teach his false God. He was the guy that was next to me. He's looking over at him, trying to like tell him stuff. And those who were next to me heard what I told him. I said, "Get the hell out of here!" And I never want to see you here again. Who heard me say that? See, it's in the mouth of two or three witnesses. <laughs> because hey, I'm going to rebuke him sharply. I'm not going to sit there and, and let that guy uh, come back and, oh, well, you know, he's just a little mixed up. We'll pray for him. No, we'll tell him to get the hell out of here because we're not going to have somebody come into our church, blaspheme Jesus, blaspheme the Trinity, blaspheme the King James Bible, try to separate themselves, try to teach false doctrine. I told him, hey, hit the road, Jack, and don't you come back no more. Amen. And that's what I'll continue to tell him. That wasn't even the first time I've done that. Uh, and it won't be the last. Uh, where are we? 2 Peter chapter 2. And many shall follow their pernicious ways. That's why so many people follow Billy Graham, John Hagee, all these false teachers. God said it would be so. 
But look at verse number 10. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness. Again, we're talking about the fact that the false prophet and the pervert are one and the same. It says here that they walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness. What does unclean mean? Dirty. Vile affections. Filthy is what God called it in Jude. Sodom and Gomorrah is what he compared it to. Look at verse 14. Having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin. Reprobate. They can't cease. They're wicked. It's too late for them. Beguiling unstable souls. We talked about that earlier. At heart they have exercised with covetous practices. We saw that in the book of Jude. Cursed children. Look at verse 18. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escape from those who live there. The lust of the flesh, uncleanness, adultery, filthy. You see in the pattern here? Read Jude and 2 Peter 2. You'll walk away knowing that those two groups of people are one and the same. Now, we got to hurry. Titus 3. Point number 7. How, does, how do I identify the false prophet? Point number 7. They love debate. Did you hear that? They love debate. They love arguing. Debating. Now, here's the thing about this. We believe, and this is what we're going to read right here in Titus 3, a man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition, reject. Now, this guy who came in on, on uh, Wednesday night, he said, yeah, because then we can get together in the small group. Of Bible we can debate and discuss. He said, I said, no. I said, we don't, we don't do debate. He's like, no, debate's a good way to learn, he said. Debate is how we can, is how we can find the truth. We can, we can go back and forth and debate. And he said, what's the difference between debate and preaching? I said, because preaching is me preaching the Bible. And then somebody could walk up to me afterward, and if I made an error, people have come up to me afterward and said to me, you know what, this that you said was actually not quite right. One time I said that Michael Landon died of AIDS. It turned out he died of cancer. It was another one of the stars of Little House on the Prairie that died of AIDS and was like an AIDS activist. You know, So there was some buddy who died of AIDS and was an AIDS activist on Little House on the Prairie. I thought it was Michael Landon who was somebody else on the show. Michael Landon you know, was married three different times, divorced, and, and smoked. Did you know he smoked four packs of cigarettes a day when he died? I didn't even know that was humanly possible. And so he died of cancer because he was smoking, you know, I guess, apparently because he was smoking four packs of cigarettes a day. I, have you ever even heard, has anybody ever even heard of somebody smoking that much? You've heard of it? I, I didn't know that was possible. But, you know, so that was an error. And it's funny because people are shocked when I make a mistake. Like, oh man, if somebody said they've been listening to like just scores of my sermons and then they heard me say this one thing that was incorrect and they said, now what? Now I feel like you can't believe anything you said. <laughs> I'm like, do you think I'm Jesus? Do you think I'm the Bible or something? I'm sure I do say things that are wrong. That's why you need to check it out in the Bible. I said Michael Landon died of AIDS. He died of cancer. It was a different person on Little House on the Prairie that died of AIDS. Whoops. Sorry. Big deal. See what I'm saying? I might say things that are wrong. One time I said this. I said that the first commandment that God gave man was to be fruitful and multiply. Somebody came up to me and corrected me after the service and said, that's the first command in the Bible. It is the first command in the Bible. It's in chapter 1. But he said, chronologically, God actually told them not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil before he made that statement because he told just Adam before Eve was created and God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. Because Genesis 2 recaps some of the events in chapter 1, Right? And so I was right that it was the first command in the Bible, but it was actually the second command given to mankind chronologically, and I said, thank you for showing me that. Now I know that you know, I learned something. But is that debate? No. If I say something and somebody corrects me, that's not debate. That's, that's how you learn. Debate is a back and forth. And it's worthless. It's worthless. Anybody who's a soul winner knows that it's worthless. Amen. Anybody who's been in a debate at the door knows that it's worthless. It's not how you learn. Because usually in a debate, well actually always in a debate, one person's right and one person's wrong. So how is it educational to listen to somebody who's wrong keep insisting that they're right? That's what a debate is. A debate is a person who's right and a person who's wrong 
The person who's right insists that they're right, because they are right. The person who's wrong keeps insisting that they're right. That sounds like a good way to get confused, listening to somebody who's wrong keep insisting that they're right, again and again. Now, I looked up the word debate, and I told the guy on his eye, I said, look up the word debate in concordance, it's negative. I looked it up. Two times, it's totally unrelated, it's just a different meaning of the word. Neither one of those is positive either, it's just a different meaning of the word. But two times it's used referring to debating, like doctrine or whatever, it's always negative. Every time. There's no positive mention where God tells us, you know, debate doctrine, debate the Bible doctrine. Don't, you know, argue with people. No. It says in verse number, where are we? Titus 3 9. But avoid foolish questions. Are you listening? And genealogies and contentions. Contentions are arguments. And strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. Now, is it wrong to argue with somebody? No, it's not wrong, as long as it's within the parameters of verse 10. A man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject. So, God tells us, correct the heretic. One time, he doesn't get it. Correct the heretic a second time, he doesn't get it. Alright, see you later. Now, that's not much of a debate. Because the debate is back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. See, God just allows back, forth, back, forth, by. That's God's plan. Man that is an heretic, a person taking an admission, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. Look at Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. While you're turning there, I'll read verse 25. Who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshiped and served the creature, more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause gave them, God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use, and that was against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. Verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate. You see that? Filled with debate. He says, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. Somebody name for me one thing in that list that is positive or can be construed as positive. In any Everything in that list is wicked. Look at the list again. Everything's a sin. Everything's wicked. But debate is wonderful. Debate is what we need to add. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, church is not enough. We need debate night. I don't think so. That's the only time the word debate is ever used in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, it's used in two unrelated ways. It has nothing to do with this. You can look it up on your own. The third way it's used is when God rebukes people for fasting for debate. Okay, so what we're seeing here is that debate is a sign of a pervert and false teacher, according to Romans chapter 1. They love to debate. People, somebody called me a couple weeks ago. I'd like to debate, debate with you on my radio program. I said, I don't debate with anybody. I said, if you want to know what I believe, listen to my preaching. I said, why would I argue about it? I preach it, it's true. There's something else to say. I don't have anything to add. Why would I debate? Why would I answer a fool according to his folly? And then I'll be found to be like unto him. That's what the Bible says. And number eight, look at uh, 2 Peter 2. They hate and tear down authority. This is the last point. They hate and tear down authority. See, so what do you mean by that, Pastor Anderson? While you're turning their quick review, number one, they separate themselves. They want to get people apart, pull them off to the side, split the church and take people with them to false doctrine. Now, there's nothing wrong with splitting the church as long as you're kicking people out. I mean, I, you know, if you're throwing out people who believe false. But when somebody rises up and starts teaching false doctrine about the deity of Christ, the Trinity, they worship the Jews, uh, they, they want to debate... They, what, they're, per they're perverts, they're speaking things that are lustful and dirty. You know, they're getting up and talking about the bedroom, right? What goes on between a man and a woman, they're getting up out in the pulpit and talking about that. False prophet, false teacher, here's a name for that, Dr. Jack Scott, 
Ammon, Indiana, pervert, weirdo. Look at all this, you know, I don't know, I'm not even, I don't even have time to go into that. Believe me, that guy is a pervert. I mean, he gets up and, and talks about the dirtiest stuff imaginable. And that Christian womanhood spooktacular in October, or spectacular, sorry. The Christian womanhood spooktacular, where they, they get up and they literally, ladies get up and teach sex ed. And teach graphic things about the bedroom. At Howells Anderson College, they had a book in the library by Tim LaHaye called The Act of Marriage. It's pornography. It is the raunchiest pornography. Period. Say, oh, I can't believe you said that. You know what? If you want to, if you won't feel like poisoning your mind, go pick up a copy of it. Go throw it across the room within 30 seconds if you have any Christianity at all. Because it has dirty pictures in it and dirty writing in it. I brought it into the office when I was at Howells Anderson. I slammed it on the desk. I said, what is this? This is pornography. It's filthy. Amen. Clint Cavanis, independent fundamental Baptist pastor in Oregon, wrote a book called When Risque is Okay, graphically describing the acts between a man and a woman. Graphically, detail by detail, moment by moment, second by second. He's a false prophet. He's a false teacher. He's a pervert. Jack Scott's a pervert, saying that communion, likening communion to what a man does with his wife, likening the broken body of Jesus Christ to the... To, Going to bed with somebody? Filthy. Filthy dreamer. Where do they dream up this stuff? They're filthy. They're animals. That's what the Bible says. I don't like you naming the names. <laughs> Alexander, Hymenaeus, Hermogenes, Philetus. Didn't Paul name the names? I think I just named some of his names. What chapter are we in? <laughs> somebody help me out of here. I don't know where I am. <laughs> 2 Peter chapter 2. Oh yeah, the last point. Point number 8. They, they, tear, they hate and tear down authority. Now let's, let's stop for a second here. I'm not saying that they tear down a particular person who's in authority. I'm saying they tear down the institution of authority. Let me explain to you what I mean by that. Look at, look at 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 10. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government. Okay. Now, we're not saying that they despise a certain leader, but they despise government, like they despise authority. They despise anybody being in charge or ruling. Do you understand that? So, you say, I mean, think about it. If you're living in Cuba, would it be wrong for you to hate... What's that guy's name? <laughs> Castro. Castro. Would it be wrong for you to hate Fidel Castro? Oh, you despise government. Or if you were in Nazi Germany and you hated Adolf Hitler, would that be wrong? No, you're not despising government, you're despising a particular wicked government. I mean, look, our government that's sending Viagra to register offenders and pedophiles, that's something to despise and hate. A government that protects abortion and protects homos, hey, but we're talking about people who despise authority. They despise government. In the book of Jude, he says it this way. Let me turn there real quick. I didn't have this in my notes. But he says the same type of thing in uh, the book of Jude, if I can find it. He says in verse 8, you know, they despise dominion. Do you see that in Jude 8? They despise dominion. Dominion means lordship. They don't like anybody to have authority over them. Does that make sense? They despise dominion or government. Now, it doesn't mean that they despise a particular person who's a wicked person in authority. I mean, if there's a wicked person in authority... They need to be, like they took out Ceausescu, right? And shot him on TV. Great! You know, they, they took out uh, Adolf Hitler and, and they killed him. You know, they, they, killed these, uh, they killed Mussolini, right? They executed him on television. Great. Wonderful. Because these guys are wicked and deserve to be destroyed. But what we're talking about is people who hate authority in general. They want to have nobody ever tell them what to do. Let me prove it to you. Look at verse 19. While they promised them liberty. So they call this lack of authority, they call it liberty. Now, anarchy is not liberty. Lack of authority is not true freedom or liberty. He says, they promised them liberty. They themselves are the servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome, of the same as he brought in bondage. So God's saying a lack of any authority actually brings bondage. But they promise it as liberty. Look at, just like Jesus said in John 8, 34, don't turn there. Jesus answered them, verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committed sin is the servant of sin. 
So these false prophets and false teachers, they don't like somebody getting up and preaching rules and authority. Number one, God's authority. God has rules that you're to live by. They don't like preaching on sin many times. They don't like somebody to get up and, and say, hey, this is how men are supposed to dress according to the Bible. This is how women are supposed to dress according to the Bible. This is how we're supposed to live. This is what we should and shouldn't do. I mean, God forbid that I should get up and say that a woman should not wear that which pertains to a man. And I say a woman should not wear pants because that's men's clothing. And skirts right. and dresses are women's clothing. Amen. Amen. But see, they say, oh man, I can't believe you can't tell me how to dress. God's the one who's telling you how to dress. God said that a man should not dress like a queer and a girl, but that a man should put on man's clothing, a woman should put on woman's clothing. We don't need unisex clothing either. We don't need clothing that can go both ways. You say blue jeans can go both ways. No, blue jeans are a man's clothing, and a woman needs to go put on a woman's clothing. There is no unisex clothing. Not in God. In God's eye, God said a woman's garment and man's clothing. But listen to me. They don't like somebody getting up and telling them how to dress. It's not me telling you. It's God. They don't want God to tell them how to dress. They don't want God to tell them how to live. They don't want God to tell them how to raise their kids. They don't want God to tell them what's right. Because they despise government. They despise anybody with rules or telling them what to do. Now, here's another example. Genesis 3.16. Now, you're, you're like, John 3.16? No. This is a much less famous verse. John 3.16 is the most famous verse in the Bible. Genesis 3.16 is the least famous verse in the Bible. Isn't that amazing? My friends, this is proof that the Bible is inspired. This is proof that God ordained the numberings of the verses in the Bible. Because what kind of a coincidence that Genesis 3.16 be the least quoted verse in the entire Bible and John 3.16 to be the most quoted. I'm kidding, of course. It's a joke. Does anybody understand my joke? Because Genesis 3.16 says, under the woman, he said, I've never heard this preach in any sermon. Except when it was coming out of my own mouth. Okay, and when I listened to it later on tape, just so I could say I heard somebody say it. <laughs> because it said, Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Amen. But see, that's Amen. the most not quoted verse in the Bible. The Bible says that a husband is to rule over his wife. I've heard Pastor get up and say, A husband should not rule over his wife. You didn't get very far in your yearly Bible reading this year, did you? You didn't even make it to chapter 3. What, you get hung up in chapter 2 about the firmament? Hey, chapter 3 says the man should rule over his husband. But see, what did I say? I'm telling you, in California, we got men ruling over their own husband. That's the world we're living in. We got men marrying men. That was planned. No, I'm just uh, what does it say in the Bible again? <laughs> hey, look, it's not my fault that I messed that up because when I was growing up, nobody ever preached that verse to me. Now I'm mixing it up. Now I'm saying it wrong because nobody ever even taught me Genesis 3.16. Having to relearn it as an adult. Makes me mad too. <laughs> but anyway, hey, men should rule over their wife. Right? So men should rule over their wife. Am I saying it right now? Thank God. I was in the flesh there for a minute. <laughs> hey, men should rule over their wife. That's what the Bible says. But you see, false prophets and false teachers don't believe that. Are you listening? They believe that uh, they're trying to break down these institutions of authority. Is what I'm trying to say. A man ruling over his wife. Parents ruling over their children. Okay, and, and look, I do believe in submitting to the government. Many false teachers, you know what they'll get up and teach to? Not to pay your taxes. Is that what Jesus taught? Jesus taught to pay them. Okay? Uh, did Jesus teach uh, rebelling against the U.S. government and refusing to submit to their laws? Only when they contradict with God's laws. That's the only time we're to disobey the laws of the nation. You, the only time, wives, that you should disobey your husband is when he's contrary to what God preaches. The only time, children, you should disobey your parents is when it's contrary to what God preaches. And by the way, you say, wait a minute, Pastor Anderson. You obey every law in the United States? No, because God said this. Let every, subject, let every soul be subject to the higher powers. And guess what the highest power is in this country? Who knows? Who knows what the law of the land is in this country? Come on, Mr. Political Guru. What's the law of the land in the United States of America? The Constitution of the United States. So any law that contradicts the Constitution of the United States, God tells me to be subject to the higher power, which is the Constitution of the United States. That's the supreme law of the land. 
So when some cop wants to search my car and I tell him to drop dead, hey, that's not me despising government. That's me obeying government because I have the right not to be searched without a warrant. Amen. So if I tell him, no, you will not search my car. I don't tell him to drop dead either. I'm sorry. I, I, see, I make mistakes. But I told him, I said, hey, you're not going to search my car unless you have a search warrant. Oh, you're rebellious. Oh, you rebel. I'm not a rebel. I'm obeying the law of the land, which says that I'm to defend the Constitution from all enemies, foreign and domestic. And so when some cop tells me that I have to let him search my trunk, he's an enemy of the Constitution because he is telling me something contrary to what the law is and putting on a badge and claiming to uphold the law. When he wouldn't know the law if it smacked him in the face. <laughs> which is why, why 3,000 babies are going to be murdered tomorrow. Because he doesn't know the law, he doesn't offend the law, he doesn't care about the law. He wants to search my trunk. I've got cool stuff in my trunk and he's never going to see it. <laughs> and so look, here's another authority that they despise. The authority of the pastor. You know, this guy who was here on Wednesday night, he was trying to tear down my authority as the pastor, was he not? Right. Now look, I'm not... The pastor's authority is in the church. The dad's authority is in his house. The government's authority is in public affairs. The government doesn't have the right to rule my house. The government doesn't have the right to rule this church. I don't have the right to rule the government. I don't have the right to rule your house. And so when I say I have authority as a pastor, I'm not trying to tell you what to do outside of church. I'm not trying to tell you. But I do have authority in the church. Guess who makes the decisions in church? I do. Guess who decides who preaches behind the pulpit? I do. Guess who decides the music? I do. Oh, we need to vote. Can anybody remember the last time we voted here? It's because it never happened. No, if you have a good memory, it just never happened. Uh, we don't, this is not a democracy. No, this is a theocracy. God is in charge here, and God's the great shepherd, and I'm his under-shepherd. That's what the word pastor means. But you see, these false prophets, here's what they'll try to do. They'll try to take authority away from the pastor. You know why? Because they know that the pastor of Faith Word Baptist Church is mean, and he knows the Bible, and he's going to tell him to get the hell out of here. That's why he wants to tear me down and get some pansy waste, some, some milk toast deacon or somebody making the decisions, making the calls. Somebody who's not filled with the Holy Ghost. That's what they want. And, and listen to me. False prophets want to put the deacons in charge. Now let me prove to you why that's unscriptural quickly and then we'll be done. 1 Timothy 5.17 Let the elders that rule well, elder, bishop, and pastor are synonymously used in the Bible. Let the elders that rule well be counted as worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. God is saying that the elder is to rule in the church. The bishop rules in the church. I don't rule your life. I don't rule your... I, I never tell you what to do. But in church... I will veto music that's wrong. And I'm going to be the one that decides whether it's wrong based on the scriptures. And I will decide who preaches behind this pulpit. And if you don't like it, then go get another pastor because this elder is going to stop the wolf from coming in. He's going to stop the false prophet from coming in. He's going to stop the pervert at the door. I don't like the way you talk to that guy on Wednesday night. I don't like the way you mouth off the queers that have been here and, and pervert. You, you like it or lump it. It's the way it's going to be. But he said, look at Hebrews 13, 17. Hebrews 13, 17. Now who knows what the word deacon means? The word deacon means servant. That's what it means. And the first deacons were ordained in Acts chapter 6 to do the daily administration of the work of God's house. And they were to feed the widows. You remember? They were to take care of the widows and the daily administration, the menial work, because the apostles didn't want to just Wait tables all day, they said. We don't want to just do all this. We don't want to sweep the floor all day and do all this. We need to be preaching. We need to be soul winning. We need to be praying. We need to hire some people to help us. And they got to be spirit-filled preachers were the qualifications. They must be full of the Holy Ghost. They must be a preacher. They must have pretty much almost the same qualifications as the pastor himself to be a deacon. And churches are... Look, look what it says in verse number 13, or, or Hebrews 13, 17. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Turn to Proverbs 30, the last place we'll turn. Deacon means servant. 
Not the legislator, not the boss, not voting on what we do. Now, I can understand churches that have the church vote. I don't necessarily agree with it, but it makes a whole lot more sense than having a couple of servants vote. Are you listening to me? I mean, it would make more sense. If they want to vote on something, why not have the whole church vote? Why a couple of businessmen who don't go sowing? Why businessmen who don't preach? Because they're a deacon. It means nothing. But look, what the Bible says. For three things, this is Proverbs 30, 21. For three things, the earth is disquieted and before which it cannot bear for a servant when he reigned. And a fool when he's filled with meat, for an odious woman when she is married, and a handmaid that is heir to her business. God's will is not for a servant to bear rule. When you go to your job, you're the employee, you're not the boss. The servant is not the boss. The boss is the boss. And in the house of God, Jesus is the boss, not the servant. Not the deacon. Deacons should not reign. God does tell the elder and the bishop to rule, to reign. But it's only as a representative, just like a delegate, executing God's will. God has written the will. This is the will. I'm the executive of the will. You know, every will, when somebody dies as an executor, I'm just the executor of the will. But I am the executor of the will. The deacons aren't the executor of the will. And so they, tear, they hate authority. They hate going to church and somebody's in charge. If they or that church, it's Pastor Anderson. You believe it? They hate the fact that at my house, Dad is in charge. They hate the fact that in the government, somebody's in charge. See what I'm saying? They just hate government. They hate authority. But let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, please just help us not to be fooled and deceived, dear God. We know that the false prophet's coming. It's only 